Thanks for listening to today's PVG broadcast. You can support this podcast and all things It's Guest Gaming by joining us on Twitch, YouTube, and Patreon using the links in the description. Oh. I have a podcast, too. Huh. Well, hello there, everyone. Long time no see. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming on Twitch and on YouTube, and I'm sorry for my absence. I've been very busy, both with all of the online content as well as family life, but I'm back, hopefully a lot more frequent than I used to be. So, we have some things to catch up on, as does Disney Sorcerer's Arena. They came out on Friday night while we were live for another event with the DSA Road Ahead. And I kind of need to talk about it. There are some good things within here. There are definitely some things I'm worried about. But either way, it's worth a conversation. So while we were live on Friday night, all of a sudden we get a giant post from the community manager, Meathead Militia, talking about what's coming up in DSA. Now, I personally think that this post was reactive to all of the activity that was happening with Disney Mirrorverse, another mobile game that we talk about here on this channel as well, that has taken the US and the world now by storm because it's a new shiny toy. It's a new mobile Disney battle game. And Disney Sorcerer's Arena has every reason to be worried about it. So at the end of their launch week, we get some information about what's coming down the pipeline for Disney Sorcerer's Arena, sort of. They say it's been an exciting first half of 2022, and they want to get right into what's coming up. Some of it they talk about in the near future, like the Buddy Bonus Program, which, to be completely honest... I'm not sure how I feel about it. Essentially, it's a free rewards mechanic between you and one other person. Something that you can send back and forth, like a currency of some kind, because there's also another new friends experience built within it. They're really trying to push clearly the sense of community. But I'm not sure if they're going about it necessarily the right way. If you're a longtime player of Disney Sorcerer's Arena, you have been through the ups and downs of the last two years. And the biggest thing that has gotten us all through some of the hardest moments when there hasn't been very good content or there hasn't been much content, whether it be new characters, whether it be a new game mode, no matter what it is, it has always been about the community. It has been about the people that you play with, not necessarily the content that you play. DSA has finally picked up on that notion, and they're looking to make most of their improvements over the next year focusing on those mechanics specifically. Whether it be the friend currency that has this notion of maybe being exclusive, you can't buy it, you can send it to people, but only so much a day. It sounds good in theory. And I took the weekend off, I came in fresh, re-looked at these patch notes, And the new friend's experience about sending stuff to a friend, whether it's a limited time currency, whatever it is, I've started to fear that this idea may just turn into another trackable daily. We talked about it in quick live reaction if you want to go take a look on YouTube for the DSA patch notes recap. I fear that it's just going to be something you do once a day, really quick. Go ahead and send your currency to so-and-so person, and you move on. And a lot of people in a lot of clubs are going to try to control this. If it rolls out as something that you can only do to a certain amount per day, so, okay, you're in club so-and-so, you have to donate X amount of currency to player so-and-so within the club every day. I worry that it's just not going to execute what its intent is. 
So we need to learn more about this experience that they're thinking about. But if there's any piece to it I want to highlight again is that I do believe this should be an experience that you cannot buy. There should be no way to purchase this type of currency. The free-to-play community is not just free-to-play. Remember that. A lot of the free-to-play community invest in ad time. They watch ads over and over and over. That's how you get free gems, free energy, free attempts, etc. All of this is essentially free money for Glue Mobile. And they need to push on that to keep the game alive. People underestimate how important the free-to-play market technically is. And you can be a spender in this game too, obviously, and continue to watch ads gain more attempts, etc. DSA needs to push on this community specifically, and I see that they're trying. They clearly want to. They want to make it a better experience for the player, and they want to make it a better experience for the club. They're trying to bring those two realms together with their little improvements about club searching. And it sounds like they're taking some of the tools that are already out there in the community and looking to just implement them within the game. Finally, I did enjoy seeing some changes in regards to how you can search for a club. It is a little blocky right now within the game. And if there can be more specifics about what kind of club you're looking for, by the most recent raid they completed or their total power or summoner score, whatever they choose to do, I do like the idea of having a little bit more customization when it comes to looking for a club within the game. We do get stuck in the Discord mentality sometimes for those of us who are in Discord, and we forget that most players of the game do not utilize it. To bring that cohesiveness to the game, this makes a lot of sense. So I I appreciate that they're actually going in that direction overall. Finally, just within that piece, I do want to focus on one specific portion to it, which was the option to auto-join for a new player. I think, in theory, this is a great idea. As long as clubs have the option to uncheck this option. This could be really annoying and mildly disastrous if clubs do not have the option to take this notion off. For example, if you're a top 100 club, chances are you have your own form of communication via Discord most likely. You have been recruiting people, whether it be from global chat or global Discord or any other means of acquiring new players for your club, and you may want to limit which people can even apply for the club so you're not being bombarded endlessly with applications in-game. That's a big piece. As long as they put that little checkbox for the club leaders to say if auto-join is on or off for their club, I think it's a great idea. But let that asterisk be on the notions of how to roll it out. Next up, they finally roll out the maybe about acknowledging sort of the level cap increase. Y'all know from the prior podcast, Gear Tier 10 incoming, they're going to put it out there. They know it. We know it. I know it. It's inevitable. They have to move up another gear tier, another level cap up to level 90. It was also the first time that the game recognized the idea that maybe a premium character doesn't just come from raids. Now, there have been some divided conversations about does the next big exclusive character, like a Kidda, like a Zeus, etc., come from Club Expedition, or does it come from Raid? We finally heard from the devs that it could be either. I'm going to nominate the idea of both. I think it would be very, very interesting to see a premium character only be able to be obtained in a rapid way by excelling in two game modes. Hear me out. Right now, we've been in the pattern that gear tier 7 to 8, you have exclusive currency that gives you exclusive pieces from the Forbidden Depths. Going from 8 to 9, you have the same thing with Siege on Olympus. What if from 9 to 10, 
out of the two RAID exclusive pieces as we've known them for a long time, what if those pieces is just one from a RAID? And what if the other one is a different set of currency that's exclusive to club expeditions? Maybe you put a little bit in tier 9 and you put the higher amount in tier 10. Now you've got a variety of different currencies and a variety of different speeds in which they can be obtained. You might have a club that's running heroic on all levels. Might even be running a tier 9 potentially club expedition. But if that club doesn't have Peter Pan, for example, all set up to gear 8, or the rescuers for their adventurers squads all set up to gear 8, etc. What if that becomes the unique way they roll that out? I could see them doing that. Whether it's two currencies, whether it's one currency, I could see it being in two game modes. But if they do, I also do think that that may be the presence of a full shift for DSA if they do that. If they push more emphasis towards club expeditions and not raids, I worry about the community. Because one of the things that we love as a community right now, more than any other thing in this game, is the theory crafting behind the raids. Not the strategy of finding our way through the expeditions, because unfortunately, the AI doesn't run the same way as we do. Because right now, the top tier is only gear tier 7, 6 star enemies when you're going up against them in club expeditions. The downfall on that is that it then goes up in tier 10 eventually of club expeditions to most likely gear tier 8, 7 stars. If you've gone up against any bot, you're going to wipe the floor with them. It happens in PvP and it happens in a variety of other game modes. The opponent is never equally as strong. So if this becomes the premiere, it's still going to be very boring. Because I know with my gear 8 squad at 7 stars, to try to take down a team using the AI only from DSA, with the same gear level, and the same power level, my team's going to win 9 times out of 10 on auto. It's not a challenge. Raids are. They force us to look at the kits differently. They force us to theory craft and create new combinations that we may have never thought of before. A new raid also gives us the opportunity to revisit some tunes that might need something a little bit more special to them now. We saw it happen to Ariel. We saw it happen with all of the sorcerers chosen. This could be another opportunity for the exact same thing again, for some new characters or returning characters to have unique kits that are exclusive to a raid. To me, that's the most important thing about doing this level cap increase and bringing out the idea of gear tier 10. Make it still about the raid. You want to throw in some club expedition? Go for it. But keep it all as one currency. Don't do two currencies for each of the nodes to bring a character from gear tier 9.5 to 10. The next piece they rolled out within all of this was the new potential tunes. They rolled out Alice in Wonderland as the new legendary potentially, 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 with Alice as the legendary and the necessary characters being the Mad Hatter, Cheshire Cat, March Hare, the White Rabbit, and the Caterpillar. Many people in the global discord especially have been pushing for this notion. I for a long time thought it was a little bit of a stretch, specifically with the Caterpillar, because obviously we already have the Queen of Hearts and we already have the card soldiers in the game. So I didn't know if they were going to really go that far and try to pull in the infamously hookah-smoking Caterpillar into DSA. It does appear that they're leaning in that direction because this all fell under the category of near future, which in DSA terms typically actually does mean the near future within the next month or two when they use that nomenclature historically. Another dynamic duo they put out there was Remy and Linguini from Ratatouille. Me personally, I'm not sold on them. 
I don't know if I would go all out trying to get Remy and Linguini unless if their kits were just straight up godly. However, however, they've put the carrot on the string, people. They finally said what I've been asking for now for almost two years. Y'all, they're thinking about Edna Mode. Now, if you know the history of It's Guest Gaming, it started off as Edna Mode and Guest. Do not tempt me with a good time there, people. If you're going to do it, do it right. You've already put a sub-faction on Frozone, Violet, Jack-Jack, and Dash now. What are you going to do with Elastigirl and Mr. Incredible? Are you going to make a new supers category? Bring in, you know, Void, Electrics? Are you going to expand on the super villains maybe with Underminer? I don't know. But if you do, do me one favor. Rework Elastigirl. Rework Syndrome. But do not make a capes category. If you know Edna, you know why. This is my call to the devs. To say, reach out, and I will gladly help you name and theme the abilities for Edna Mode in the game. I will throw my hat into the ring. Let me help you with this one. I got this. This next portion is brought to you by our Patreon community. Everybody, I have some of the absolute best supporters in the world. They have been constantly supporting me, whether it be the good, the bad, or the ugly through Disney Sorcerer's Arena, now also through Disney Mirrorverse. My Patreons have been fantastic, and I wanted to shout them out and say thank you for allowing me to do what I do every day. The least I can do is reward you with a shout out here and remind you that every month, we guarantee time privately, one-on-one, -on -one, whether you want to talk about Disney Sorcerer's Arena, Disney Mirrorverse, or any other game that we're talking about here on stream. I'd love to be able to have a conversation with you about you, your roster, what your goals in the game are, how can I help you get there, and just relax. It's a game. We're going to have fun. We're going to do it effectively, but that's what the Patreon community is for. Moving on forward. Now we're into a whole nother section that, to me, is an even bigger carrot on a string. They just simply called it the future and beyond. Before I even talk about it, I don't know if DSA should have talked about it. Because now they have to deliver. Now they have no choice but to deliver because of the reaction from the community. They're clearly trying to excite us and rile us up on the notion of giving us exactly what we want. And in many ways, I'm totally for it. But if there's anything the devs should have learned from the past, it's that sometimes if you overpromise and underdeliver, we will not let you live it down. Who else remembers going up against a potential miniature raid boss in some new version of Club Dungeon that might connect to Club Conquest? What happened to that? Where's Tamatoa? We still remember that, and we never got it. What do we get instead? A broken Queen of Hearts. They are looking to try and set us up for following the next three months. So, essentially, the final quarter of the year. Most likely. Maybe. Potentially. I'm not sure yet. They brought up the biggest notion of what we've all wanted. A social PvP. A way that we can connect directly to someone else in our club. Or our friends list. Be notified and have some kind of buddy system also in play. Where the success of your buddy succeeds for you too. The idea of matching up in PvP with a bolster, that was the most exciting news in my opinion. I would absolutely love to know that I can unlock a character, find someone else who has at least unlocked that character, and start theory crafting and testing in live PvP with that character maxed out. So now I have 
all of the tools and all of the information in front of me to make an informed decision by myself about is this tune worth it? I'm not exclusively relying on the information of a few, myself included, but I'm relying on my own experience of unlocking a character and deciding, hmm, you know what? Maybe Winnie the Pooh isn't someone I want to aggressively go after right now. It's great to have him unlocked, but I might put that honeypot back on the shelf for now until a later date. I can now do that. And that's exciting. As a content creator, oh, the, the options are endless for me. But for you as a player, I think the most exciting thing about that is the idea that now your play in the game could be endless Because you could do it the way that you want to. You can customize your environments. You could customize how many turns, how much of a bolster, who you battle exactly and why. You could do club competitions, giant DSA competitions, which I will 100% be holding. There's a lot of options in there. Lobbies, ability search, uh, active player search, etc. There's so much in this little pool of how to make social PvP successful. Because it is, still to this day, one of the most prominent pieces of what makes DSA DSA. They're one of the few that have this live PvP environment in the way that they do. And they should push on that. There should be a way that maybe they can monetize off of it. But the biggest way DSA is going to monetize in this day and age in this time of DSA history, is by staying alive. Because right now, it is barely hanging on by a thread. And that makes me sad as a huge supporter of this game. This carrot on a string might be a little bit too big, unless if they truly deliver promises and keep them. I love the new social PvE 9.5 experience tease about who could it maybe be, and they focused on three big words, big, red, and angry. Some people are saying turning red. To me, that makes no sense. Some people are saying Tafiti from Moana. That makes a lot more sense. But the one that makes perfect sense, in my opinion, is Genie Jafar. It's the right era for having the primary spenders of this game want to spend more, want to spend their dollars, want to spend more time, give more investment to what they're doing because it's a character that they know and love and grew up with and they have an emotional attachment to. If there's anything my Disney training taught me, it's about the importance of emotional attachment. And even in a mobile game, That is important, especially when you're looking at the environment created by Disney. Why do you think so many people still to this day love Kingdom Hearts? Because there's an emotional attachment within those characters and from you as a player to those characters. Whether they be characters that premiered in the game or that have been around for nearly a hundred years, there was an emotional attachment there. And Genie Jafar has that piece where everybody, as I say that character's name, can perfectly associate who that character is with being someone that's evil, being someone that's very well recognized, being someone that is going to be a fun piece to go after in the game. I think that's great if they go that direction. Tafiti might be playing to the wrong audience, just like Turning Red, which I think is too recent, to be a primary feature game mode. Because look at the history of these big game modes. They're focusing in a very specific era and time window when it comes to theming. Little Mermaid, Hercules, Atlantis. This would fit right within there with Aladdin. I think it makes total sense if their big, red, angry thing is Genie Jafar. They do want to bring potentially other new tunes like Evil Queen, The Huntsman, which I have no interest in. Evil Queen, yes, just not The Huntsman. And Kanto, which to me is also a complete no-brainer. One of the most successful Disney movies of the last 10 years. 
even with the pandemic, it was very successful. Way more successful than Turning Red. But I'm going to throw a couple other groups and pairs out there. For the same reasons that you're thinking about Turning Red, maybe go ahead and bring in Luca and Alberto. Maybe there's a speed piece or a mythical oceanic hybrid we could bring to the table. How long is Judy Hopps going to be the only Zootopia cast animal member thing in DSA? Where's Flash? Where's Nick Wilde? What if we go in a complete opposite direction that I'm going to say the names for? And some of you may not know, but then think of the theory crafting based on the one character you do know. What about Fawn? Silvermist? Rosetta, Iridessa, all of Tinkerbell's friends. Is anger really going to be the only representation of Inside Out? Or do we finally get to see Radigan and Basil? There are a lot of great duos and trios that can be brought to the game. Alice in Wonderland is a classic that, at this point, kind of mandatorily needs to be there now that we finally have Snow White. Historically, for the game. Many of these Disney characters have that emotional attachment. And for the exact same reasons, many people in the DSA community have an emotional attachment to this game. It got them through a very hard time. It got us through a moment when the world shut down. And now that the world is opened back up, the game is struggling to find that attachment again. Because more people are more attached in other places. Looking at the road ahead for DSA is a smart idea. And broadcasting that road ahead is a very smart idea as well. What would not be smart would be backing off these promises. They use the word potentially a lot. But the last thing DSA needs to do is tease us with another carrot. What do you think? Do you think that there is a lit path ahead of us? Or is this a dark, windy, scary dirt path? For me, I do think we are going down a path into the woods. But right now the headlights work. And I've got the high beams on. And I hope you're ready for the ride too. If you're willing to go on that ride with me, please go ahead and like, subscribe, follow whether it be Twitch, whether it be on YouTube. Come join us on the guest list as we see what happens over the next few months in DSA. We are going to theorycraft everything. We are going to speak through those resources. We're going to look through the new ascension that comes to be with gear 9.5. We're going to do it all together. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to the return to PVG player versus guest. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming, and I look forward to seeing you on the guest list.